Hope City Church, my name is Chrissy and I'm one of the pastors here. Let me be one of the first to welcome you and thank you for joining us for Church Online today. Especially if this is your first time, we're so glad you're here. Sometimes hitting play is the hardest part, so thank you. We trust that you will be inspired to know, love, and follow Jesus. Whether through the worship songs or the teaching, we hope today is just your first step in what will be a relationship with Jesus. In fact, if you're looking for what might be a great next step, I want to invite you to join us on Sundays here at the Hope City Building for our 10.30 gathering time. That time is slightly different from what you'll get here online as we're focused on gradually ramping up to full services again. Our time together on Sundays is a rich time of encouragement, equipping, and calibrating around who we are as a church right now and what God has in store for our future. So if you're looking to get a better taste of who we are, we would love to have you join us. However, if you're going to join us next week, don't forget to set your clocks forward an hour as daylight saving time is next Sunday. That's of course assuming that you have a watch or clock that you have to set manually, but it's worth a reminder anyways. Finally, Easter is quickly approaching and we couldn't be more excited about it. We'll be hosting Easter services on Sunday, April 4th. So here's your save the date. That weekend will be a fun time geared towards the whole family as we gather together and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. More details to come in the following weeks. But for now, save the date, April 4th, you're gonna wanna be here. And again, I'm so glad that you could join us. Now let's join the team for one more song before we continue our series in Luke. It's your kingdom come and your will be done. Let your name be praised and your banner raised With every breath, this we pray We are yours, Lord, have your way Let 
your kingdom come Let your spirit move Lord, we welcome you Let fire fall down On this holy ground The young see visions as your spirit falls on us again That your kingdom come To God be the glory, honor, power forever Here as in heaven, your will be done Yours is the glory, honor, power forever On earth as in heaven Let your love speak hope and your word breathe life. With our hands held high, Lord, be glorified. Let every heart join as one, every nation, tribe, and tongue. Your King. Thanks so much for joining us for Church Online. It was so exciting to hear that Hope City was at capacity last Sunday for the in-person gathering as we prepare for Easter, which is only one month away. And friends, I just want to encourage you now more than ever to, to get connected and be a part of what God is wanting to do in the season. And during this in-between time, we have launched this new series simply titled Luke. And we're using Luke's gospel, which is a collection of eyewitness accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus found in the New Testament. And it doesn't matter if this is your first time or, or umpteenth time that you've looked at this book. This series is designed to remind us that this is a book that was written not merely for information as much as for transformation. And it's my prayer that we would allow Jesus to work this out in all of us, because I truly believe that he is not done with us by any stretch of the imagination. But this is key, especially for this series, for us to be truly transformed by the Spirit of God through the scriptures, we need to understand the context of the scriptures. To put it simply, context 
is critical. And so for the next three weeks, this next section of us looking at the book of Luke, we're going to look at a collection of the miracles of Jesus that we find and make sure that we have the right context for why they happened and how it applies for us today. In fact, I heard this quote by Jeremy Kubitschek this past week at a leadership gathering, and I think it fits perfectly here. Check this out. There is practically nothing that messes with people's relational harmony or dynamics more than broken expectations. And this is true for our relationship with our friends at home, at work. And I would submit to you that this is very true with our relationship with God. Because if we don't understand the scriptures, if we use them out of context, we will experience a disconnect from God due to the broken or the false expectations that we've created out of a misunderstanding. And I don't want that for your marriage, for your job, and I certainly don't want it for your relationship with God. So today, to look at things in context, we're gonna look at the story of a blind man that Jesus heals in Luke chapter 18. And when we're talking about uh, this blind man, you know this, that, that you don't have to be physically blind to be unable to see, right? I mean, especially when it comes to seeing God, sometimes we view him with, with eyes or, or lenses that need to be adjusted. In fact, when I wore kids, uh, when I was a kid, I wore glasses and I actually found them in a box at home. These are my very own glasses, probably straight out of 1984. And, uh, and I put these bad boys on and they're probably pretty trendy now. They probably should be bigger for my face. But uh, I'm telling you that, that these glasses don't work for me anymore. And there are some times where, where po possibly we have a lens of God from when we were kids, that as we became adults, it, it didn't seem right. The, the lens needed to be adjusted because what we, how we saw God as a child is not how we're seeing God as an adult. And if we don't have the right context for who God is, we will not see him clearly. We need fresh eyes. We need, we need new lenses, upgraded lenses to see. And then there are other kinds of lenses. There are these types. These are blue blocker lenses that Jen bought me because she's worried at how often I'm looking at screens. Check these out, pretty cool. And, and what these do is these block certain things, block the blue light so that you're able to see correctly and not damage your eyes. And that's pretty cool, but some of us, some of us have a lens when it comes to God where, where we allow certain things in but we keep other things out. And God wants us to be able to see him not just partially, but fully. And others of us, we have a lens that, that have, has simply been shattered. You can't see God correctly because at some point something broke. And maybe you got a glimpse of God for a moment through some of the cracked lenses, but more than anything, you need God to heal. So let's look at the story of someone who was blind, but was also able to see God clearly like I hope we all do. And it's found in Luke chapter 18. And I'm going to read the whole story and then we'll unpack it together. So let's begin in verse 35. And it says this, as he drew near, this is Jesus, as Jesus drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. Verse 37, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. In verse 42, it says, And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And it wraps up with verse 43. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. What an incredible story. A, a, a blind man who is rejected by society somehow gets the attention of Jesus and Jesus asks him what he wants and he wants to see and Jesus heals him. It's a great story. But remember, context is critical. And if we're not careful, we can read a story like this and think to ourselves, well, let's see. Jesus asked the guy what he wanted and he got it. 
So I guess Jesus is wanting to ask me what I want so I can get it, right? I mean, he gave a blind man sight, so maybe he'll give me a job or a spouse or a house or a mouse. Okay, not a mouse, but I mean, come on, we do this all the time if we're honest. And when the life or, or the, the thing that, that we want doesn't happen, what does it do? It breaks up our expectations with Jesus that, that actually severs the very life he came to give us. Come on. How many of us know somebody or, uh, who's done this or, or we have our own story? You know, God, I asked for a job and, and I didn't get it. I'm out. Or, or God, I asked for my mom to be healed and it didn't happen. Why? Uh, why is this happening? And what happens is we read a story like this in the Bible with poor context. And then we, we actually allow it to set us back from what God wants for us. So let's go back through the story verse by verse and unpack something so much better than just getting what we want from Jesus. And as we do, we're going to see the true meaning behind the story. So Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 35, here it is. As he, Jesus, drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. So Jesus has this huge following by now, and he is on this steadfast mission on his way to Jerusalem where he will be crucified. And to get to Jerusalem, he has to go through Jericho. Now, quick fun fact about Jericho. Jericho was known as the city of roses, just like Portland. But the city in this context, it's hopping. The, the crowd is following Jesus. And, and not only that, but in this context, there would be a massive pilgrimage of Jews also making their way to Jerusalem for the religious celebration of Passover. So here in the midst of all of the commotion, we find a blind man and he's trying to figure out what all the added commotion is about. And in verse 37, it says this, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. N notice the difference here. Jesus of Nazareth versus Jesus, son of David. And this is incredibly important for the message today. The crowd was following Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher. He was Jesus from Nazareth. And there were a lot of rabbis at the time with followers. There would be a lot of rabbis, teachers, and people would follow them around and, and hear what these people were like. And so people were following Jesus like he was a rabbi. And people had all different thoughts of, of who Jesus was. But this blind man, he spoke of Jesus not as a mere teacher, but as Jesus, the son of David, as the prophesied Messiah in the line of of David and all throughout recorded history the Jews would would constantly talk of this coming king that would come from the line of David from the Old Testament and would overcome the tyranny of both the Greeks and the Roman domination over the Jews it was in their daily prayers their their sermons at the time were constantly referring that someday the son of David re would return and this man with amazing blind sight, if you will, this lowly beggar came to the conclusion that Jesus was the Son of God. Despite his blindness, the eyes of his heart had been opened and he believed. And this, this was his moment to encounter his Savior. But remember, he's blind, he's begging. His chances seem slim. Look at verses 39. It says this, And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. I mean, have you ever tried to get someone's attention in the midst of a crowd shouting at them, trying to get their attention? Ever tried to make eye contact with someone when your voice couldn't be heard? I remember something like this in, uh, in 2014. Friends, 2014 was one of the best years in the history of the world. And do you know why? Do you know why it was one of the best years in the history of the world? Because that year, my dear friends, is the year that the Seattle Seahawks, my beloved since birth Seattle Seahawks, won the Super Bowl. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Now, if you don't like the Seahawks, 
I'm sorry, but just bear with me. You see, 2014 is the best year in the world because it's also the only year that the Seahawks have ever won the Super Bowl. But in 2014, the Seattle defense, AKA the Legion of Boom, shuts down and dominates Peyton Manning and the Broncos. They had the number one offense in the history of the NFL, but my Seahawks dominated. And for the first time, my team brought the trophy home. And even though I wasn't at the game, I had this incredible opportunity to be at the victory parade. And you guys, one million people lined the streets of Seattle along the route in the freezing cold, certainly not social distancing to see the world champions. And I got to be here. There, here's a picture of that moment. Here's Eliana. She just wanted to go home. It was so cold, so excited. My extended family here, we were so excited. And it did not matter that I was a full-grown adult. I was screaming and cheering like a kid, hoping that beast mode Marshawn Lynch would see me as he tossed the skittles to the crowd. Like I said, I can remember it like it was yesterday. But the problem, the problem with me trying to get the attention of my Seattle Seahawks is that a million people were all doing the exact same thing. And as much as I wanted to make eye contact with, with Russell Wilson or, or Pete Carroll, I didn't have a chance. And in our story here in Luke, it's kind of the same thing. The city's going nuts. Everyone is out to check out who this Jesus of Nazareth guy is. But this, this blind man, he couldn't even make eye contact, much less get past the people who wouldn't let him get close. But I love his persistence. Look at how the verse continues. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He rejects the crowd control and shouts again and again, Jesus, son of David. Not just Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, son of David, my Messiah, have mercy on me because he deeply understood two things that we deeply need to understand ourselves. He understood, number one, who Jesus was, and number two, he understood his own personal need. And over and over again, like, like a helpful, helpless infant, he would cry out. But, but much like this, this childlike persistence uh, was going on, it may have seemed childlike, but it, it's more mature than we may realize. See, the blind man, he had this extreme sense of urgency that revealed what should also be in our souls. If we take this scripture into context, this is the, the understanding, the, the modeling of a blind man that should be for us because this is the meaning of Jesus's words found a couple chapters earlier in Luke chapter 16, verse 16. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, the law and the prophets were until John and since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. This sense of urgency of pressing in. In fact, in the Old Testament, the Lord instructed his people in Jeremiah chapter 29, 13, and it says this, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Put simply, breakthrough belongs to those who go for it. And this, this blind man was going for it. Now let's take a step back. The book of Luke. Do you see the movement that is found in the gospel of Luke and in the example of this blind man? Last week, I talked about Peter and the movement of him towards Jesus. And here, this blind man refuses to be quiet and presses in. He had all the restrictions and limitations of life. He's begging, he's blind, he's behind the crowd. But none of that could keep him or disqualify him from pursuing God. Come on, church, this fires me up. The example of a blind man is to be our example, where maybe apathy or excuses or disappointment may have tried to convince us to give up that it's not worth it, that, that your chances are slim. The blind man shoves all of those things aside. Why? Because this isn't just Jesus of Nazareth. It's not just a nice teacher with, with some good things to say, like, like a, a version of chicken noodle soup for the soul. This is Jesus, the son of David. And this blind man had every right to pursue the one who could renew and restore. 
I don't know, maybe COVID or, or politics or, or, or some sort of church drama or setback or, or screw up, whatever it is, has, has gotten in front of you, like the crowd in front of the blind man and has told you to shut up or maybe to give up. But not this guy. This guy's a champ. And he has no shame in his game. And he is crying out for his savior. Again, this this childlike cry should be seen as mature, not immature. It's childlike because only a few verses earlier in this chapter of Luke chapter 18, Jesus had said regarding children, look at this. Verse 17 of chapter 18, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This doesn't mean we should be childish. It means we should have childlike faith. And this man was like a small child who is well aware of his helplessness and dependence. And he doesn't hold back. Why? Because number one, he knows who he is. And number two, he knows who Jesus is. And that opened the door for everything. So look at the next verse in the story. It says this, and then, then Jesus stopped. Over and over again, we see that Jesus somehow hears the hurting voices above all the other noises, and that is incredibly good news for us. Amen, somebody. Come on. I mean, this this man was was labeled as a blind beggar, but you and I both know that you don't have to be physically blind or, or financially poor to be in drastic need of Jesus. In fact, sometimes I, I, I think we could agree that our physical sight or our financial gains are the very things that could keep us blinded from seeing ourselves as needing our Savior. In, in many ways, this blind man could see things that many people couldn't see. Let me put it this way. Only one, one of the only things worse than blindness is not knowing that you are blind. Multitudes are blind to their darkness, blind to their sin, blind to their destiny, blind to their hopelessness, spiritually out of touch, and they don't even realize it. I mean, human reasoning would say that every time a person sins, they will see more of their sin, but the opposite true. You and I know this. Every time we sin, we make ourselves more blind, less capable of realizing what sin is, less likely of realizing that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But thank goodness that we don't have to stay in the dark. I mean, think about this. How incredible is it for us to be able to see reality even when what we see is unpleasant or or grotesque because when we see what we are, when we actually see, when we cannot escape the truth, when we are surrounded by darkness and we know it, then we can be able to ask for the light And scripture teaches us that the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our heart. And it's the Spirit who removes the veil that keeps us from seeing Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that fixes our lenses so that we can see him properly. And it's my prayer that we would continually ask God to open the eyes of our hearts. Uh, Someone once bluntly asked blind and deaf Helen Keller, isn't it terrible to be blind? To which she responded, Better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. So it was with a blind man. Sometimes blindness has its benefits. He had a lot of time in his blindness to think without visual distractions, time to develop maybe this interior life and and a contemplative spirit to see with his heart. And as much as we have hated the disruption of the pandemic, as much as many of us hated losing power and Wi-Fi for many of us over a week during the ice storms, there is something powerful that can be found in a forced detachment from the daily grind. An ability to to do that inner inventory of our lives that that we've been too busy to notice, a, a part of our lives that we have been blind to. And this blind man, he had a lot of time to think. And maybe, maybe in this season, you have too. Maybe you've even needed a message like this moment to have your eyes of, of your heart opened. 
The blind man could see his need and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in the midst of this lit up town, Jesus stops in his tracks because these are the kinds of prayers that get God's attention. Friends, Jesus isn't interested in agendas. He's not interested in positioning for power. Jesus hasn't, doesn't have time to stop for ridiculous debates or, or church wars or political posturing, but a broken and a contrite spirit stops him in his tracks. And now it's, it's important to remember that, that Jesus was on a fast track to Jerusalem. He was on a mission just 17 miles away where he would be crucified. His heart was set on mission. On one hand, nothing could have stopped Christ from finishing his mission. No opposition, not even the the pleading uh, by his loving but ignorant friends. No protesting from Peter could stop him. But, But the humble cry of a blind beggar who recognized his need full Stop. And this is a great reminder for all of us that Jesus' mission is never so big that it excludes the single one of us. His love for the world will never overshadow his love for me and for you. I mean, come on, how great is that for us? When we feel lost and and, and alone, when when it seems like people just want to shove us down in a way, when when people just want you to to shut up, people still, Jesus still, he still shows up. Before, Before we get any farther in the message, I just feel like someone needs to be reminded of who our God is and where our God is. Look at this power pack verse really quick in Romans chapter 8. Paul says this, for I am convinced, he knew this about Jesus, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to what? Will be able to separate us from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wherever you are is wherever Christ can be. And even though this blind man is is behind the crowd in the front and unable to see Jesus, Jesus hears him and he sees him. So Jesus stops and he hears this blind man in the midst of the crowd and the verse continues and it says this, and when he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? I love that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some of these stories parallel in each of the books. And Mark's Gospel includes the same story and gives us this little bit of added insight in chapter 10 of verse Mark. Look at this same part. Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. I love the imagery that Mark gives us in this story. It's like when when Charlie finds Willy Wonka's golden ticket and he realizes that he has it. He's like, boom, right? Like, let's go. And he jumps up and, and he's like, I got it, I got it. And this man, he realizes that he got the golden ticket and he jumps up, throwing off of his cloak. He springs up and he comes to Jesus. I love this. The son of David has called to him. So so back to verse 40 and 41, it says this. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And the story wraps up and Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him glorifying God and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Okay, so much insight here as the story comes to a close. But what did this man do? 
In this story, we see this blind man calling to Jesus. We see him believing in Jesus. We see him coming to Jesus. We see him receiving from Jesus. And then we see him following Jesus. And he glorified God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Friends, this isn't a story. The context of this story isn't about a man getting what he wanted. The application for us is not to go, well, Jesus asked him what he wanted. So Jesus needs to ask me what I want because I've got a list and Jesus needs to show up for me. No, the context of this story is of one man who wanted Jesus, was seen by Jesus and was impacted by Jesus so that he could live and follow Jesus. I mean, just think about this. If, if we were blind, if you were blind and could all of a sudden see what would you what would you want to do? You'd probably want to see your family. You'd probably want to see the hills and, and the seas and all that nature has to show. And I'm sure, I'm sure that he would end up marveling all of those things. But Luke shows us that what this man desired more than all the other things was to see the man who had opened his eyes. He was all about. Jesus. But how often have we wanted something from Jesus without any real desire to follow Jesus? If we don't understand the context, our sight, the lenses through which we view Jesus will result in broken expectations that will actually leave us farther from him. I mean, when we truly encounter Jesus, we don't always get more of what we want but we do become more of who we were created to be. That man was created to see Jesus and to be seen by Jesus, and the same is true for us. In fact, scholars tell us in Mark's gospel, uh, he's not just known as the blind beggar, he's known as blind Bartimaeus. And scholars tell us that Mark's gospel preserves this man's name because he went on to become a pillar in the Jerusalem church. This man would, would follow Jesus on to Jerusalem where he would witness the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday and the horror of the, the crucifixion and the joy of the resurrection. This man was all about Jesus. And like blind Bartimaeus, we need to, number one, we need to see our need. Number two, we need to see who Jesus truly is. He is Jesus, the son of David, not just a teacher or an advisor. He is the son of God on mission to restore us and to invite us on mission to help restore the world to what it was created to be. And number three, like the blind man, we need to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He is the one who will make all things new. This past week, my nine-year-old Eva was really excited about uh, memorizing the scripture found in Psalm 121, verse one. And we were driving around town and she uh, begins quoting it in the back seat. And I think it's the perfect verse as we wrap up the message today. And it says this, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. See, friends, the, the eyes were not this man's prize. His eyes merely allowed him to see where his help was truly coming from. And I wonder, I wonder if your lenses need to be adjusted like my childhood lenses that, that no longer work. I wonder if you're hungry for a new level of faith, a new ability to see Jesus, a new maturity to your faith that isn't just asking Jesus to be the genie in your bottle, but now you would say, I want to mature and see you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Maybe you need to say yes to all of Jesus. It's the blocking lenses that, that you've uh, you picked up and you've been picking and choosing what you will believe and what you will do. And it's time to say, God, I want all of you in every part of the way. Or maybe, maybe there are the, the shattered lenses that you found yourself wearing. And you've been trying to follow Jesus and the brokenness 
And by surrendering to Jesus, you can allow the healing to take place. But no matter who you are or or what has happened to your vision, I want to invite you to keep calling out to God. And may we all have fresh resolve in this new season as a church to put our hope in Christ and Christ alone. Friends, I believe that God is working in us during the season of transition. I believe God is wanting us to see him more clearly than ever, to put our hope in him, to lean into him, to to persevere, to press through all of the noise and to return to the mission that Jesus has invited us into. Removing that which has hindered you to follow Jesus or to be a part of what he's doing, may we say, God, I want to follow you now more than ever. Help me to see you clearly and in the right context. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for hearing us and seeing us, even when we may feel like like the noise of this world is so loud, even when we feel like we're, we're behind the front lines, that, that perhaps you don't see us. Thank you for reminding us today that you see us, that you hear us, that you have a plan for us. And thank you for inviting all of us into what you have next. So God, Jesus, Son of David, Messiah, King, Lord, help us to see you as you are truly meant to be seen and help us to follow you every step of the way. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody, I love you. I care about you. I believe that God is preparing us for what he has prepared for us. And I can't wait to see what he does next. See you next time.